Hello, everybody. Welcome to today's talk. It's a, a dear to my heart, this one. So it, it's all about aspects of Gloucester Railways, the material we've got in the archives. Um, it, so by its very nature, it's a quite an eclectic mix of stuff because I've just sort of got in and drawn stuff in from everywhere. But there's a, a little bit of a, a sort of a, a coherent structure to it. So we'll start off with basically... I have to start off by ignoring all the tramways that were in the country. And there are a lot of those in the forest, like Hampton Hill, Gloucester, to Cheltenham, etc. Because by definition, I'm going, going railways, not tramways. But essentially, the, the sort of the county's railways comprise two main companies with some smaller ones. And the big two, no, then the Great Western Railway, um, East, West and South through the Southern Cotswolds, lines radiating out from Gloucester and Cheltenham. And then you had the Midland Railway, which ran north, south through the county. And again, with some branches going into the Southern Cotswolds, it later became the London, Midland and Scottish Railway after the big grouping that happened in 1924. And basically the government decided we've had enough of all these hundreds of railway companies, we'll merge them all together. But from the 1800s onwards, there were lots of other railway companies around and they kept sort of forming as the years went by um, and this the main reason for this was the sort of this realization that they needed to link the main lines to places that these little companies were interested in. so among them were these here so you've got the middle and the southwest junction railway seven and y joint railway cheltenham and great western union railway the forest of dean central railway seven bridge railway dursley and midland junction railway stonehouse and nailsworth railway chooksbury and malvern railway and, I, and i've probably forgotten a few um, but interestingly, although these companies in the all started out as independents, most very quickly aligned with, with, or they were merged with, or they were taken over by the two larger railway companies. So sort of by the end of the sort of the, the railway era, sort of, sort of say 1920s, they were just the sort of the main big ones. But, you know, lots of these names stay, stay in history and we will see some stuff as we go through. So quick idea, and I, I thank Colin Maggs, this great author, local author for Gloucester Railways. This is a sort of taken off one of his, his images here. This is, gives you an idea of the layout of the lines. And this is 1920s, though this is not quite at its peak, but coming close to it. Uh, and you can see we've got a lot of lines everywhere in, in the county there. And again, we'll, we'll look at a few of these as we go through. Not in any great detail, has to be said, but you'll, they'll get mentioned. Um, so... For the railways, what do we have? Well, there is the canals. Um, and we in the archives got this fantastic letter from the Thames and Severn archive. It's written by John Denyer, who was the company's uh, agent or manager, as you say, at Brimscombe Port. Um, and every week, he sent a letter to John Stevenson Salt, who was the company treasurer in London, with details of traffic on the canal, water levels over the summit, which is always critical with the Thames and Severn um, because it was leaking water a lot. And he included in this letter items of interest that he'd heard about. And this letter is fantastic because it's got this one really prophetic sentence halfway down the middle there. Mr. Brunel, with others, have been going all over the proposed line of railroad along this valley, which I consider is indicative of the report having some found foundation so obviously they heard a report about they were going to put a railway up the valley this is obviously going to be dreadful for the canal and so this is a confirmation of it the line itself was the Cheltenham and Great Western Union Railway which was supposed to be running from Cheltenham to Swindon um, Brunel was its chief engineer he did have it did have fits and starts so bits of it started and it got to Swindon then it uh, from Swindon to Kemble then it stopped but it was sort of pushed forward forward again um it opened fully in May 1845 and it took much of the canal traffic and we literally within 70 years the Thames and Severn Canal was essentially abandoned. Luckily today it is being reinstated, the Cotswold Canals Trust are doing a lot of work down there um, and hopefully before long we'll be able to get on a boat at Saw Junction and go all the way through to Letchlade on the Thames so that'll be superb when that does, does happen. There's a thing called the breaking gauge. Um, in the early days of the railways, there was a so-called gauge rule where between railways using Brunel's broad gauge, which is seven foot and a quarter inch, and the Stevenson gauge, or as Brunel called it, the narrow gauge, which is four foot eight and a half inch. And essentially, the problem was that where trains and runner stock met, they couldn't they couldn't run on both gauges. That lots of complication. So where the breaker gauge occurred, and Gloucester was the most famous one, passengers and freight had to change trains, which added delays, cost, and inconvenience. Um, the Stevenson gauge was more popular in the north as it was used around the coal fields. Uh, that's where Stevenson was based in the north. But the broad gauge dominated in the south and southwest. So there was this sort of real battle going on about you know who, who should what gauge should should reuse. 
news. Um, and I got this lovely quote from Illustrated London News here. Um, Gentle reader, re reader, if you wish to know what a break of gauge is, a journey between Birmingham and Bristol will make you very sensibly conscious of it. The gauge being thus broken, your journey is brought to a complete halt. With all your luggage and rattle traps, whatever they be in size and number, you're obliged to shift from one carriage to another. You will hear the railway policeman bawling in the deaf passenger's ear that he must dismount. You will see anxious mama hastening her family in its transit from carriage to carriage, dreading the penalty of being too late. Your dog will chance to have its foot crushed between wheelbarrows and porters' baskets, howling more terrifically than the engine itself. And if your horse's carriage is accompanying you, they too must shift by dint of weeping cajolery. You resolve that no consideration will ever tempt you to bring your horses again by railway where there is a break of gauge, which I think is amazing. And so the very famous pictures there, sort of going from one train to the other, it must have been quite a thing to see. Um, 1846, there was a Royal Commission investigated this. The regulator of the Gauge Act followed, um, and Stevenson's gauge of four foot eight and a half inches became the standard gauge, and broad gauge slowly began to disappear. And the picture here gives you an idea of the difference. This is from Didcot Railway Centre. Uh, on the left, you've got Stevenson gauge, which is the current gauge of the railway, and on the right, you've got sort of Brunel's broad gauge. Um, the thing to look at to get an idea here is actually look at the front of the engines to see how far apart they are. Brunel's gauge had lots of advantages to it. Um, we're now stuck with quite this, this what we do call a narrow gauge, and it has lots of restrictions on what can be taken on the railways. Um, but the broad gauge had one last local hurrah um, on the 6th of October 1849 while travelling from Barrowmoral to Osborne House. Queen Victoria had to change trains at Gloucester. She'd come this way to avoid London, which had a cholera outbreak. Um, she arrived at 11.30 to peals of bells, artillery salutes and addresses by the mayor and local clergy. clergy and she basically crossed the platforms, boarded the GWR broad gauge train and left almost as quickly as arrived. We think she was here for about 15 minutes. Now, I'm not sure she ever came back to Gloucester for that one. But again, the pitch here from the London Illustrated London News, you get sort of the idea of her crossing the platform. So look at the material. So whenever railways were built, construction materials were required, vast quantities. Um, and this is a little contract we've got for the London and Birmingham Railway. Um, it was sent to David Mushet, one of the Forest Dean Iron Masters, in 1835, presumably to see if he would tender for the contract for supplying bricks uh, or blocks, I should say. The blocks were probably going to be used in the construction of embankment walls, but I, whether the Forest of Dean Stone, especially the Pennant Sandstone, which is probably thinking what he was mining, uh, was suitable, isn't known. And we don't know whether he responded to this. The railway itself, the London and Birmingham Railway, um, came in full operation from 1833 onwards to 1846. Then it became the London and North Western Railway and ultimately the London Midland and Scottish, the LMS Railway. And today it's still in use. The southern portion is the West Coast Main Line. One of the things you notice when you're looking at all these these sort of railway companies, the number of mergers and changes in name there was makes it really difficult often to, to follow a railway through. So who built the railways? Well, the building of the railways was the name of the navvies. They came, name was navvies from navigators because they basically built the canals. Vast, literally gangs of itinerant labourers. Everybody thinks they're all Irish. They weren't Irish, only made up about 30%. And they were basically going from job to job around the country. Um, they and their families lived and worked in really appalling conditions, rough timber and turf huts alongside the sort of the infrastructure they were, they were making. And, and this photograph of navvies by their sort of hut comes from uh, Leicestershire, uh, Leicestershire, Leicester and Rutland Record Office. So thank you very much for them to letting us use it. The Navvies had a reputation for fighting, hard living and hard drinking, and, and most Victorian society viewed them as complete degenerates and a threat to social order. But to be fair, most of that criticism was unjustified and, and a lot of them were quite well behaved. Um, and despite exploitation. We've all heard of like the Tommy shops where the navvies were paid in money, but they can only spend it in the company shops. Extreme deprivations of living in these huts. The navvies really achieved some amazing feats of engineering, equipped with, really, with little more than gunpowder, pick shovels and wheelbarrows. And um, the picture on the right there is barrow runs and the cutting. They would be excavating the cutting and they would literally have to get the barrow of soil right up to the top using a windlass. And we know there are lots of accidents with these. 
Um, we have this real poignant little thing here. We know the deaths in the work, Navy's workforce was common, typically 3%. Sometimes if they're doing tunnels, it rose much higher. Um, and we got a little entry here in the church and parish's rough burial register, which recalls the burial of a young Navy aged about 15 who had died whilst working in the railway cutting at Hynham. And the map there shows you roughly where it was. This is the entry in the register. I know you can read that, but here's a little thing. A lad, name unknown at church in the churchyard near the first yew tree southeast corner of the churchyard killed in the Hynham cutting or downs bridge of the great western railway when it was made new the burial took place on sunday evening when about a hundred of his mates attended the funeral dressed in white slops and trousers and the 12 bearers wore each one a white rose on his left breast and the rest came two by two it was a beautiful sight he was supposed to be about 15 years of age name unknown also his birthplace and i think that's such a poignant thing these these lost this young lad they obviously knew him and liked him and when he was buried they, they came and they their numbers it must have been an incredible sight to see so with railways by law any plans of a public undertakings at the time had to be the plans had to be deposited with the relevant clerk of the peace the appropriate counties so um, these include canals horse or tram railroads docks rivers turnpike roads water supply ferries bridges, gas schemes and tramways. But the great majority from about 1830 to about 1875 are of railways. Um, and this is the cover of one of them we have here in the archives. This is for the Gloucester and Forest Dean Railway of 1845. And if you've got keen eye there below the 1845, you can see the name I.K. Brunel as the engineer. And he did a lot of work in, in the area. Um, these plans are typically really large manuscripts, literally maybe a two foot by one foot sort of thing. They usually have books of reference, which gives you details of the ownership, occupation, use and area of the land affected by the schemes. They vary greatly in detail, to be fair, but almost every time only the property adjoining the railway is shown. Um, some of the good ones are based on the relevant OS one inch to one Mars sheets uh, and they have the line put over the top and these are a couple of examples here from the Banbury and Cheltenham direct railway on the left hand side. Uh, that's Lansdowne in Cheltenham and the Gloucester and Forest Dean Light Railway here on the right and that's actually a line going through Gloucester leading and out and you can actually see roughly in the middle of that is where we are today which is the archives building on Alvin Street. Um, Interesting, what's really good about these these q ones is that many of the schemes were never actually carried out. So we've got like lots of plans of railways that were never made. So it can be really interesting to see the thinking behind how these people wanted these railways there and why, and then abandoned them for sort of almost no reason. This is the typical page of a book of reference, one of them. This is for the Gloucester and France Dean Railway. And again, it's showing through the land that was taken for the parish of St. John the Baptist. It shows properties, owners, who or reputed owners, because they often weren't sure, and the leases and occupiers. And this is all to sort of basically say, well, you need this land, you'll get compensation, this amount, et cetera, et cetera. They also often have cross sections of the line. And again, this shows the sort of the cross section of the line from um, Gloucester to Hynham, um, basically showing the gradients. And we'll look at a one of these later on going through. Um, this is a lovely little receipt. It's very old from 1841. It's from Hartnell Railway, Tanner and Hartnell Railway Van and Wagon Carriers. They're Winchcombe Street in, Jel in Cheltenham. And it's a very stylized picture at the top. But I do like it. It's a stylized 222 locomotive. That's using what they call the white notation. So you look back on the Google at the table, what it's all about. And some carriages and everything there. And it actually just records the carriage of a single hamper of the Reverend Hathaway to Bristol, cost of about three shillings, about nine pounds today. Um, and like railways before them, like canals before them, I say, railways offered a really excellent way to move goods around the country, especially goods with a high weight to value ratio, such as coal, that's the most important one. But of course, the railways had the real advantage is they were much faster than the canals. So it's much easier now to distribute stuff around the country. Um, I've got this one's King Coal. From the 1800s onwards, coal provided about 90% of the energy consumption in the UK, and most of it was carried by rail, which just distributed fantastically huge volumes around the country. Um, and this is one we got a little uh, invoice from Stevenson Clark and Associated Companies in the archives. Um, incidentally, these were the 
Britain's oldest shipping company, and they specialise in what they call short sea shipping. So they're taking sort of coal, stone from one port to the other, quite close and not long distance stuff. Um, but again, it gets complicated because this comes actually this, this goes to a Daniel Watney and Sons, who are land agents in London. Um, but it records the sale of six tons or a wagon load of Ferno D number no. three washed small nuts. Uh, well, I've done a bit of research into this, and it's a type of smokeless coal, a natural smokeless coal produced by Powell Duff who are actually partners to Stevens and Clark. So again, so complicated, but it's rather nice. This is the idea um, you're going to order it. Now, these, this one was to be delivered to Adelstrop Station to a Mr. G. Edgington. Presumably he'd collect it all from there. Um, and deliveries like this would have been taking place all around the county and the country. So there would be lots of this going on. So in Gloucestershire, coal primarily exported by rail from the mines in the forest of Dean uh, and to a lesser extent South Gloucestershire. The coal fields weren't quite as big. Um, and if you have a look at these wagons, this shows Lightmore Colliery in Dean and Fox's Bridge. You can see lots and lots of rail wagons there. And these are going to be filled up with the coal and sent away to the destinations. Then they would come back usually and get loaded again. Um, this one here, this shows Lydney Canal, so Lydney Harbour been extent for a long time, but it was actually purpose built, helped ship coal. And even on the left hand side of this pitch, you can just make a, a coal loading chute. So the barges, boats would come into the harbour, into the canal, fill up with coal and head off again. Very often in the early days, they would head straight across the river to Sharp Nest to offload the coal where it could easily get to the, sort of the rest of the railway network in, in England. And we'll look at another reason for that later. We look at what we call the permanent way. This is everything that's literally fixed down. So it's not the locomotives, the railing stock, it's virtually every, everything else. So cuttings and embankments, trains like to, they depend on friction to move. If, if there's no friction under the wheels, they don't move. So railways naturally prefer level ground. So any departure in an upwards or downward direction is called a gradient. So as to create a level as track as possible to make it as easy for the train to move, they are nearly always going through or on embankments and cuttings um, and this is a lovely gives you a great idea of it this is a cross section of the bristol and gloucestershire railway uh, bristol and gloucester railway so 1836 and it shows the rail line of the railway which is the line there called the level underneath it is the line of the land and basically where the line was above this mustard color it had to be a cutting and where it's below it Sorry, I got that wrong right. Oh, the word is above it, you had an embankment, where it's below it, a cutting. So it gives you an idea of the amount of work that was actually required to lay these tracks. Um, they were very time consuming to make, and where possible, they tend to be built close together, if that was allowable, using spoil from, say, the cutting to build the embankment. So there, there, was, a, there was a method in the madness. These also had to allow for water drainage and culverts had to be inserted um, where required. And the Great Western Railway's Honeyborn to Cheltenham line was really notable for this because it had to cross several very marshy, peaty pieces of ground where water had run off the Cotswold escarpment and was actually because the railway was quite close to it and it could cause issues and in recent years the line which is now the Gloucestershire Rorickshire Railway has suffered landslips where embankments have collapsed due to water penetration. Two happened near Gotherington and, and a larger one at Chicken Curve near Gree and this is a, is a photo from the company that repaired it showing sort of the idea the whole bank there on the left hand side is slipped downwards. What's interesting is while they're doing this, they've been looking at how the embankments were built. Um, and the line's original builders, Walter Scott and Middleton, simply seem to have dumped soil from cuttings elsewhere straight onto the land without actually trying to key it into the surface. So we know that this line, although it was a main line, there are lots of hints that it wasn't built to the same standards as some of the other GWR lines. So bridges, so where well, we had to cross a waterway, road or other gap, um, yeah, had to build a bridge, essentially. Um, this is the Severn Railway Bridge, largest rail bridge in, in the county, built in the 1870s by the Severn Bridge Railway Company, primarily to carry Farstein coal to the docks at Sharp Ness. And until the opening of the Severn Road Bridge in 1966, it was the furthest downstream bridge of the Severn. This is a more typical bridge. It's a plate girder bridge at Ryford, where the Midland Railway's Nailsworth branch crosses the Stradwater to Canal. And for those of you who like the trains, this, I've done a bit of research into this one. It's a BR standard 2MT260 locomotive, number 78001. Um, it's crossing the Canal Bridge in the 1960s. Um, Prior to March 1966, when the locomotives were withdrawn to scrap, it was only 13 years old, and the railway closed, um, I think it was, uh, 
close to about 62, 63, I think. It wasn't it's earlier than beaching, I think. But anyway, so that gives you an idea of, sort of the more typical bridge. And these bridges are still all around today. You, you'll see them traveling around the, the county. We are fortunate enough to have some lovely, a lovely photo album showing the building of the Seven Bridge Rail, Seven Railway Bridge. Um, these comes from it, and and they are absolutely superb photos. Um, they're set in an album which seems to have been sort of, it was catalogued by the library. It seems to have been a published work, but uh, it doesn't seem to be. The provenance of it is unknown. But you can just sort of see the, some of the images here. So the top left one, there's a construction barge behind it, and they're raising some of the the caissons which were put in to help build the piers. And then the view on the right is like they got some of the some of the sort of the piers are going up. You can see the height of it. The um, bot one on the bottom left is one of the spans that was going to go through the piers, and you can see the size of them just by the men there. And then finally, this this picture they've got two of the spans in place, and they're going across the railway. Um, you know, I won't go into the demise of this bridge. We we probably all heard about it, but this this album, if you're interested in this bridge, it's well worth having a look at. So viaducts, so these are essentially long bridges, basically, that cross wider valleys and low-line areas. There may or may not be a river there. Um, a typical example is St. Catherine's Viaduct, where the South Wales main line crosses Alney Island, West Anna Gloucester. And again, if you're on the trains, you very rarely notice them because you assume you're on, a, you're on an embankment. Um, but if you're driving by and you get a good view of St. Catherine's from the northern bypass in Gloucester, you, you'll, you'll know what I mean. They're also very common in towns and cities where the railway had to be carried above buildings and roads. And again, a good example is right next door to us here at Kingso in the archives, where we've got the viaduct that crosses through from St Oswald's through to Gloucester Station. And it literally is like, you know, for me now, it's about sort of 20, 30 yards away across the, the old car park of ours. So interesting, with steep valleys, rivers and a canal, Stroud needed several viaducts. And initially, these were all built of timber. They very rarely built them of brick straight away, but they were rebuilt. And this is a fantastic image. Um, it shows the timber scaffolding being used when they were bricking up Watts's viaduct which is the one that sort of you cross under if you go through Strand on the on the road there. Um, you know, am amazing feat of engineering to build these things and then to sort of brick them up at the same time. Again, Stroud Town of Viaduct, as soon as you go outside Stroud, heading towards the Golden Valley in Swindon, you go through another huge viaduct, Caples and the Canal Viaduct is known as. Then you get the Bourne Viaduct, the Chalford Viaduct and the Frampton. So you know, we really sort of forget how many of these things there are. It's not really until you're walking that you're driving under them in a car that you tend to notice them. Um, and this is an image that's not here at the archives. This comes from the Network Rail Archive, uh, and it's an elevation drawing of Capel's Viaduct, which is say, just east of Stroud Station. It's the largest viaduct in the county, as far as I'm aware. Uh, and this gives you an idea of the engineering plans of these and how big they were. You'll notice that in the, on the top drawing here, there's, there's like buildings in there. And because these spans were so big, they actually put a mill in there. So, you know, these, these things were quite really substantial structures that needed a lot of work. However, sometimes it didn't work. Uh, autumn 1902, the GWR's Channel to Honeybourne line progressing very well, and they were working on the large engineering structure on the line. So it's a gently curving 218 yard double track, 15 arch Staffordshire blue brick Stanway viaduct. It was near a completion. That's the map of where it was basically by Stanway, just crosses over that sort of a, a low lying valley with a couple of streams in it. 8.15, Friday the 13th of November, it suffered a partial collapse when the newly completed number 10 arch fell after its timber supports had been removed. And there is a crane on top of it, like the crane you can see in the picture there, that fell down with it. Um, the crane driver amazingly survived and he was rescued and moved under the nine arch suddenly just as this collapsed as well. And then while he was being dug out for a second time, the number eight arch collapsed, followed by the seven arch and massive cracks appeared in the number six arch. It you know, really was a disaster. And luckily for us today, the Cheltenham Chronicle and Gloucestershire Graphic took some lovely photographs of it. Four men were killed, including the poor old crane driver who died after being rescued for a second time. Seven other people were injured. So you can see this is really devastation. What happened to it? You know, it really, it must have been something to see this coming down. Um, the cause of it was actually never fully determined, but we think today it's probably a combination of the weather at the time, which was wet, the ground conditions, damp, early removal of the timber supports, possibly there, the wake of the crane on top and the type of mortar used. 
And it was also strongly suggested that some of the labourers building it were unskilled workers. They were bakers and farmhands drawn into the project just because of the good wages. They had no real idea of like how to mix mortar properly or lay bricks. So that might have been a reason as well. Um, but anyway, after the collapse, the viaduct was rebuilt, uh, opened to traffic the following year and carried trains until the line closed in 1976. However, it reopened to rail heritage rail services in 2010 as, a, as an extension to the Gloucester Warwickshire Railway. And it's, it's excellent to see. Today it's actually closed at the moment. They are actually undertaking repairs to it because there's been some water penetration into the track bed and they're removing the whole thing, lining it with waterproof repelling uh, lining. And then they're going to put new drains in it and everything. So it'll be good for another sort of 200 years after that i should think and it's a thoroughly great project and again support the lat railway if you can it's a fantastic one to go on tunnels um, railway builders try to avoid tunnels at all costs they'd rather go round hills than through them because tunnels were expensive and they're also dangerous to build um they're also sources of fear and apparition to the traveling public um there's a little guy called Meesum's guide to the great western railway in 1852 it's rather like a bradshaw sort of guide but there's a section of, of the line from going through to gloucester and he says the sapin tunnel which cuts through the cotswold hills before arrival at australia is an object of terror um you know and some people really don't like them even, even to this day. Um, the photo on the right there is the Tiddenham Railway Tunnel, which is now a cycle track. So if you, if you like cycling on the, the river in the forest, that one's well worth going. And the photo on the right there is the two parts coming out of the one tunnel, going to the second tunnel, uh, the Sapperton Tunnel, which we'll just mentioned. So looking at the Sapperton Tunnel, the Cotswold Startment is a really daunting challenge to any railway. And the Cheltenham and Great Western Union Railways tried to get through the Golden Valley through from Stroud. It was, you know, getting higher up with some, you know, good penetration, but still had to cross the, the major summit. Uh, and Brunel planned and partly built a long tunnel with a 1 in 352 gradient, which is a fantastic gradient for a railway. It's virtually flat. But while they were building this, the geology intervened and they came through a massive deposit of Fuller's Earth, basically cat litter, um, and it wouldn't take the railway. So instead, Brunel had to alter his plans and he had to make a shallower, steeper and shorter tunnel that had a gradient of 1 in 90. But because of the location of it, it had to have a 1 in 60 gradient on the western approaches. And that's really tough for a train. For many years in its history, there were banking engines kept at Brimscombe to push trains up who couldn't make it. And it's interesting about they're actually, we say it's one tunnel, it's actually two tunnels. There's a longer one about uh, just over a mile in length, and a shorter one about 300 yards. And it's like you go through this long tunnel, you get a blast of daylight, and then there's another short tunnel. So I'm sure most people have traveled on the line to Swindon. If not, please do. It's a great, it's a really attractive line, especially this time of year when you're going through the beautiful Golden Valley. Uh, Kemble Tunnel, sometimes tunnels had to be built for other reasons, and Kemble's a great one. The only reason it exists, because when the Cheltenham and Great Western Union Railway was being surveyed, the owner of Kemble Estate, Robert Gordon, uh, only allowed the project to proceed across his land if a 400-yard section of the track was covered so the trains wouldn't be visible from his house. Uh, and you can see on the map there, on the right-hand side, there's the line of the tunnel, which is where the track is. Kemble House is on the sort of the far right there. And to be honest, the aspect of the house doesn't even look towards the railway, but, you know, he was the landowner. You couldn't argue with him if he wanted to build your railway. He did get a bit f***y about this, and later on he insisted he should always be allowed free travel from Kemble Station, which they did agree to. Um, and later he actually had the complaint to the GWR that the trains on the track made too much noise. But I suspect by this day the, the, the railway was thinking, well, doesn't matter, mate, we've got the line, we're working it, you can't stop us now. Whitwell Tunnel, a nice big long tunnel, opened with the Bristol and Gloucester Railway in 1844. Um, 1,401 yards long, passed through Pennant Sandstone, Pennant Stone, Sandstone, Dolomitic Limestone. This last one is really hard rock, used for road quarrying, didn't require any tunnel lining. And again, if you're interested in railway infrastructure, I thoroughly recommend you have a look at the Network Rails online archive. Uh, this is two drawings from it, and again, of the tunnel. And you see they're fantastic drawings. There's much more besides. And I think a lot of people don't realise this, this um, archive is available to view. It's, it's really worth looking at.
So railway accidents, numerous railway accidents have taken place in the, over the years. Um, this is a picture of a train that was uh, derailed in Chedworth in 1901 when a boulder from the cutting at Chedworth, which you can still walk along, it's a nature reserve now, uh, managed by the Gloucester Wildlife Trust. A uh, boulder fell off this and it hit the train, or presumably the drivers couldn't stop in sign, so it's a bit like your railway children, um, and it essentially toppled over the locomotive. And we, we, I don't know whether how much whether there's a train with this or it's just a light engine, as they say. This picture here is of a crash at Nailsworth Station when a locomotive rang through stop blocks and hit a carriage. Luckily, I don't think there was many people on it, but you can see how it lifted the carriage right up and put it on top of the engine. And this is a bit more of a modern one. This is the Class 40 diesel, number 5046, Royal Fusilier, derailed on the trap points outside Gloucester Eastgate Station in June 75. Um, Basically, the actual engine was on the line you can see on the left hand side in a siding and it, the brakes failed on it and it just started rolling towards the main line. At these sort of junctions, they have what they call trap points, which derail the locomotives of the train so they don't hit the track where they could actually cause a major incident. Um, Ledbury Tunnel, OK, it's just over the border in Gloucestershire, but we've got these two images in the archives that just had to show you. April 1915, there was a serious accident when a goods train was being directed into a siding, but the driver missed the warning signal and he was unable to stop before the end of the siding. And the train went through the trap points and the station and derailed. But unfortunately, half of it derailed into the main line. And these two wonderful photographs from the Gloucestershire Railway Carriage and Wagon Works albums sort of, sort of show it. The driver was pinned under this this locomotive for over three hours by which time they got lifting equipment presumably that crane in from swindon but amazingly he escaped with only minor injuries so you know these things did happen and we're slightly bring us up to date our most real rail accident in gloucestershire was took place in 2013 when a freight train carrying containers there's a tesco less co2 rail um train derailed about four miles southwest of Gloucester on the main line, just uh, just the other side of Hynham there, um, doing 70. The driver, it's such a big train, he didn't know about the derailment until when approaching Gloucester Station, i.e. right behind the archives here, it hits the derailed wagon, hit a set of points, and it taught, maybe broke the wagon in half, basically, and tossed a, a container onto the cess, which is the track outside the ballast. Um, so this caused a lot of damage to the track, and it took a lot of repairing. But you see the picture on the bottom there, if you recognise that, that's the bridge over, that's the viaduct over London Road. So we were in a way lucky it didn't tumble down onto the archives. Level crossings, um, when railways met roads on even ground, gated level crossings were used to allow passage of road traffic and pedestrians. Um, and this lovely plan um, from the parish records, actually, of Cheltenham, um, shows the original Alston crossing. It's still in use today, although the gatekeeper's cottage is now done. And between the sort of the picture on the map on the left, which is about 1850, and the, and the drawing on the right, which is about 1835, you can see the keeper's cottage, which is the building next to Ireland, has, has gone through several modifications and it, it's more of an attractive building now than it, than it was. But, you know, we have a couple of these plans of this, this railway and they're really interesting. So, of course, where there are level crossings, you need to cross in keepers to open and close the gates. And this is a little sequence of Barton Gates crossing in Gloucester, which was at one time the busiest crossing in the whole county. Um, and I'm sure many of us will remember them. There is a great big signal box on the right hand side. And there's the station there with All Saints Church as well. Um, and these gates are opened and closed literally every sort of 15, 20 minutes very often. And though these pictures are a rough sequence, if you notice in the bottom one, they're actually the gates there aren't actually manual controlled their automatic crossing gates the crossing keepers had to look after their gates they're responsible for opening and closing them to keep the trains moving but also making sure it's safe for people to cross they also basically maintained their gates reported any defects and because they had to be there nearly all day they most of them had keepers cabins or huts for their protection and it wasn't until the 1970s that the manual crossings began to be replaced by automated gates and barriers as seen in the bottom but there are still a couple of non-automated ones. And this is the most, this is the one I know well. This is St. Mary's Crossing in Brimscombe uh, on the Golden Valley line to Swindon. And it's a manually operated survivor. And basically the gates can't be closed if there's a train coming. They're always open and they're, it's very safe to use. And it's really good to go up there when the train's coming and just watch the crossing keeper toot loud of his cottage, open the gates, close the gates and put the keys back in. It's quite fun to watch. 
there are stations, so a station size really depended on the place they were intended to serve, the number of expected passengers or the volume of goods, and also the wealth of the railway company building it. And this is a very famous picture by William Powell Frith. This is the railway station, he's just called it, but it's Paddington. It's on the Great Western there. And again, it gives you a nice idea of how bustly and hustly it must have been. At one time, Gloucestershire had over 150 railway stations and halts. Today, there are only 25, and 10 of these are on the county's heritage railways. And the stations included sort of the main line stations that we know of, so Gloucester, Cheltenham and Sirencester then. Um, town stations like Tewkesbury, Nailsworth, Town, Stonehouse and Yate there. And small halts, New Passage, Nailbridge and the, probably the world's tiniest one, Trouble House Halt near Tetbury, which we'll look, see a picture of later. But it's probably the only rail stop that served the pub, which is a great one. It'd be great to sort of come out of the pub line drive and get the train back home. So look at Gloucester Station. Uh, Gloucester's got a really complicated railway history, especially in the early years. There's no way I can do it justice. Uh, but for most of its existence, there were two stations, a GWR one and a Midland one. And the lines leading them to both in both directions form what was called the Railway Triangle, which is where Morrison's is. And on this, this map, stylized map of the rail network, you can see it there on the right hand side. And it was it formed because of various complicated running rights, this sort of thing. But in later years, the station was known as Gloucester Central and Gloucester Eastgate. Uh, Eastgate closed in 1975, and it was a really nice station. If you go out and you caught a train, say, to stride from it, you go out through sort of long Tuffley and everything, and it was a great little station. Um, today, it's literally under where Asda Car Park is, so it's it's gone. There's no trace of it whatsoever now. In addition to that, in Gloucester, you have the South Wales Railway, which ran out, ran out through King's Home. The Tuffley Loop, which I mentioned, just ran out through the city. But then you had like, the High Orchard, the Docks branches, which ran through to the docks, um, through again, through past the park. So if you drive to the Gloucester Keys Day, Keys today, past the park, you're going on the old railway line. And then there is a maze of railways on the, on the docks themselves, on the other side of the docks, and across Olney Island, where there were huge sidings. So again, a really amazing Gloucester history. Um, and if you're interested in it, uh, I thoroughly recommend catch Tony Condor's talk on the history of Gloucester Railway. It, Gloucester, it's fantastic. Moving on to Cheltenham. Cheltenham had seven stations at one time. St. James's, which was a terminus station, um, basically for the GWR, closed in 66. I remember going onto that site. There used to be a, a place called the Red House that sold glass there. Also had Crean's World in Lansdowne. This is the only station today, so it's still run today. But you had Malvern Road, which is quite close to St. James's. And it was basically the use so people, trains didn't have to reverse into St. James's. So again, it was very heavily used. Then you also had the High Street Halt, which is on the Honeybourne line. Then you had the race course. It did close, but it, now it's open again on the Gloucester Warwickshire Railway. Um, you had the High Street on the Midland, that, that sort of the Midland area, that closed in 1910. Legham Cheltenham South Leghampton, which is on the Banbury and Cheltenham Railway, um, closed in 62. So there are a lot of ones. And I certainly remember as a kid watching some of the bridges on the, uh, the, the Ch Banbury and Cheltenham Railway being demolished. You know, I remember a great big ball and wrecking chain demolishing a couple of them so there were things to see little did i know that it was you know such a sad sad time um in many places the railways couldn't get to town centers very easily so they built stations as close as they could uh, in terms of expenditure and convenience and and these are just a, a glance of some of the photos we have in the archive so you've got us church brackets for Tewkesbury there there was a Tewkesbury town station but Trains branched off from Ash, Ash, Ash Church there to get it. And Ash Church is obviously the only station there today. Um, this is the Stonehouse station on the top right. That's on the Bristol line. Of course, today there's another Stonehouse station on the uh, Golden Valley line. Um, you've gone, got Barclay Road down here on the bottom left. That again is on the on the Bristol line. That's gone now. Um, it's, again, Barclay had another station near the town, which we'll look at earlier, later. And then you've got Nailsworth, which is a, a Midland Railway terminus into Nailsworth. And again, you know, bits of that are still viable. The track still, you, you can still walk along it and it, it's quite a nice journey. But you get an idea. These, these stations were you know, really important to the places they served. Country stations and halts. Uh, this got some pictures here. Foss Cross at the top, Chedworth, there's Withington at the bottom, and Dimmock finally on, on the larger picture. And these stations, country stations, usually had the bare minimum required to function. Usually had at least one platform, two if the line was double track, a ticket office usually combined with the waiting room, a platform shelter if on the other side if it was needed, and they nearly always had a lump lamp hut, which is a 
corrugated iron used to store lamps and lamp oil plus tools uh, needed for lamp maintenance and everything so again these are lots of these sadly virtually all of these have gone now and you you'll, you won't get to see any of them um, with country stations, however, the passengers were unusually of minor economic importance, and it was the carriage of coal, livestock, and goods that kept them usually viable economically. Um, and the goods sheds and pens were typically sited on a siding so that loading and loading could be undertaken without blocking the main line, which would make it dangerous. Um, this is the goods sheds at Dimmock. When you see they have a side and leading into the stone building, and it's a flat area on the right hand side where people could bring wagons and lorries, etc., to unload into it. Uh, and again, this is the typical sort of good shed you'd see around the county. Um, this picture shows Chalford, and it's a typical cattle, sheep pen and dock, as they called it. Um, interestingly, the white fencing on most of these wasn't timber. It was old bridge rail, which is a type of rail they used on the broad gauge railway. You know, they, they prefabricate these sections, it's Swindon, the GWR works, and ship them out. And nearly every country station had some sort of dock or platform where they could load cattle on. Um, I actually think it's quite interesting having this one here at Chalford because it's not a big area for cattle or sheep, really. Um, and interestingly, we talk about livestock being transported today. The GWR rule book for livestock required that no unnecessary shunting was to be taken place with livestock. And if any shunting was indicated, it had to be done as gently as possible. So, you know, you see, they did care a little bit about the animals they were transporting. And uh, I think, if I remember rightly, the last time cattle were transported on, on the British Railway Network was about 1973 before it stopped. And of course, now they will go by road, which I think you argue that the road's probably worse for them. Station staff, so um, again, depending on the size of the station, town stations obviously been usually being busier, had far more staff and smaller ones. This is a typical small station, Haresfield, just outside Gloucester. The staff there would always be a station master. And in this picture, he's second from the right. You can see his like rather posher uniform. Um, and then as a minimum, there would usually be a booking clerk or and or a goods clerk and one or two porters. And the porters here, you can see them. One's on the far left-hand side, the others that are on the track there. You can see the uniform slightly different to the rest of them. So that's your base, basic people but you might also have signalmen if there is a box there if there is a light shunting line that porters can do they would be there telegraph messengers draymen so some stations have stables attached for horse transport so it really did depend on the station and its size and its locality and I love this picture. This shows uh, now the long gone Gloucester Eastgate. And it's got, I love the detail in this. So you've got the porters, the two guys on your left hand side there. I love the guy's beard and the hat, and the other one shifting something. Look at the difference in the goods being conveyed. All manner of boxes and baskets and bags. And then you've got the bicycle propped up there. The way it's propped up, I think it's probably going on board the train. And then, of course, you've got the little details of the people in the station itself behind in the background, which, again, really nice picture this one is. Station masters, they were generally well-respected members of the community uh, and they held a good position. People did like them. And once they tended to achieve position, they stayed there. They moved occasionally um and we've got a little sequence here so this is nice mr watkins on on the left there he's the retiring station master of ass church after 29 years 29 years service being replaced by a mr swift there who is actually uh, at beckford station which is just outside the county but he's moving now into ashford and then this chap here mr jeremiah Greenway on the right hand side the station master at kimball junction for 31 years but he'd actually worked with the railway for something like 40 years and he became a traveling inspector so you get these lovely sort of pictures of these people and sort of they must have been quite formidable characters i think signalman um vital to the road of the railways controlling train movements and mainline running to shunting <coughs> excuse me um it was a really complex task and, and they communicate with all sorts of strange instruments tapper bells keyless disc boxes telephones they could also give out tokens for symbol single track running so when an engine driver had a token he knew he was the only driver on the line um and depending on the complexity of the line they were controlled they could have a signal box that have five to 50 levers or more and this is this inside of the lever the signal box at park end in the forest of dean and there's only about i've taught me about 10 or 12 points but look at the number of levers there are um highly complicated coated task i think and I, I don't understand it it's black magic but again it's a lovely picture of this guy the station mr joseph lewis who's a signalman at sonos he'd retired 
after 47 years service and what i quite like is he got an address and an umbrella <laughs> it's not much is it for 47 years um railways obviously needed almost constant attention and also in braking uh primarily checking wear and tear and preparing the track was the realm of what they called the pw gang the permanent way gang and this is a lovely view of some of these guys in front of the sapperton tunnel entrance no doubt they were gonna <coughs> excuse me go in there and do some ent working in there at some point um this is a lovely Picture. This is the Committee of the Amalgamated Society of Railway Servants, Cheltenham Branch, in 1902, when they are presented by with their new branch banner by Cheltenham's uh, old Liberal MP. Uh, the men here comprise signalmen, shunters, firemen, there's a porter, a guard, and they're from the various different railways, so the GWR, the M MR, and the MSWJR. Interestingly, while they called railway servants, not railway workers, and it was very simply because um, most of the railways were funded and built by upper classes, and they very firmly wanted to keep the lower classes as servants, not as workers. So that's one of the reasons that they were called Society of Railway Servants. The SARS was a trade union from about 1872 till 1913, when it merged with other unions to form the National Union of Railwaymen. Um, but interesting, in 1899, it was a union that proposed the resolution at the TUC that led to the formation of the Labour Party. So we've got a lot to owe them. Quick locomotives, so express trains, these guys are the show offs. Um, this is a Lady Disdain, a 460 Saint class locomotive at speed on the GWR main line. That's a great photo. You can really sense the speed that engine's traveling at. Um, this is uh, Pendennis Castle, a castle class locomotive, passing through Gloucester in 1974. Uh, it was on the way to being sold to Australia. Um, the castle class superseded the Saint, so the bottom one took over from the top one, basically, uh, as the top flight express locomotives and they could reach speeds of 100 over 100 miles an hour i think 102.4 is the record interestingly um pendennis castle is this only the second steam locomotive to circumnavigate the globe because it went to australia via the suez canal but later returned to england via the panama canal so actually circumnavigated the globe the only other locomotive to do that is the 4472 uh, flying scotsman and that's the one doing it and if you want to see Pendennis Castle in steam. Today you can see it at the Didcot Railway Centre, which again, if you like railways, I thoroughly recommend you go for a visit at the Didcot Railway Centre. Branch line engines. So branch lines usually had tighter curves, less space around the tracks, less capacity for traffic and lower volumes of traffic. So they didn't need the big, fast locomotives. They required smaller, less powerful ones, but more nippy. And these are the sort of the realm of the 060 types, so the pannier tanks, the tank locomotives. Um, this one is it's a 74XX class, basically used for local suburban and branch line duties, as well as goods traffic, shunting duties, and as banker engines on incline. So they're common sights in Gloucestershire and there are several locomotives um, that look like this that you'll still see today around the county. This is a nice one. This is the class 1400, a, a 042 tank uh, introduced in 1932. So it's surprising how many of these were introduced quite light into the into the, into the career of the railways when you would be thinking by now more diesels are coming around. But I like these are described as nippy little engines. What was good about it is that they were fitted with push-pull control operators for auto train working. So they locally they became a very familiar site, which you look at in a moment. Shunters, bless them, these are the unfashionable workhorses of the rail world, used to move carriages into position, assemble trains in marshalling yards. Uh, this is a lovely photograph of, of a of Siam, which was the shunter used by the Gloucester Railway Carriage and Wagon Company for basically moving um, stuff along the High Orchard Branch and also raw materials, fuel and vehicles around the, the company's site on the Bristol Road. Um, this is a more typical little shunter. This is a, a class 1362 saddle tank at Sharp Nest, where it's used for, for shunting work. The whole class was built for use on docks and other sidings where the tight track curvature was too tight for any larger locomotives. So these little things get around really tight corners, um, which was the realm of, of docks. Interestingly, trains hopefully soon return to Sharpness thanks to the Vale of Barclay Railway, which is which is currently clearing sidings, and hopefully soon it means we'll have another heritage railway in the county, and you can't have too many of them. 
So I mentioned auto coaches, auto trains a little bit earlier. Um, these are basically push pull trains powered by a steam locomotive. Um, and at one end of the coach, there is a cab. So on this pitch here, on the left hand side, there's a driving cab. Um, and the driver could control the train from the cab. He didn't need to go back to the locomotive to do this. A fireman remained in the cab of the locomotive all the time um, and could advise the driver through communication systems. If there is more than one coach, so basically they, these were called now called auto trains, and the actual engine was usually positioned in the middle. And this again is a lovely picture from um, steam mills out the Cinderford way, and you can see there's a four carriage auto train here with the steam coming out, and obviously kids watching the train come and go. On the rural routes around Gloucestershire, such as the Stroud, Sharpness, Frost, Dean Branch lines, these vehicles enabled a much more frequent operation to be run, service to be run at a lower cost. So they were actually quite popular. And it was sort of one of the, the, the main sites in Gloucestershire towards the end of the railway period. Road transports, all the train companies use road transport as well. Um, mostly they used horse-worn dragons, in, but later became sort of the car petrol and vehicles, petrol and diesel vehicles. Um, most basically had box wagons, coaches, flatbeds. And this is a picture of the uh, box wagon in Steam Museum. And again, if you've not been to the Steam Museum at Swindon, thoroughly recommend it. It's a great fun day out. Gives you an idea of what these vehicles were like. But they also used buses. And this is the GWR bus number 16, um, which is a Mills Dame, the standard double deck 018 16 RO bus um, based at Stroud Station from January 1905. Um, these were used as a feeder to the train services, but also as a cheap alternative to building new railways in some rural areas. This one is, in a way, is a bit of a mystery because this one goes from Brimscombe to Chalford to Stroud. Well, by this time, Brimscombe and Chalford had their own halt. So, you know, it's a bit of a you know, superfluous service, I would guess. I mentioned the Gloucester Railway Carriage and Wagon Company earlier. This is a, a fantastic photograph from their collection showing their, their site on the Bristol Road. Uh, they made goods wagons, passenger coaches, diesel multiple units, electric multiple units, and lots of other specialist vehicles. And this is the main workshop, and it shows the photograph wall. Um, this is the wall that they took all the photographs of their equipment on. Um, it shows the traverser, which is a, you see the carriage in the back is on the traverser. So this could move along, and you could push trains in and out of the doors. And again, you've got a little, the little Siam 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 at Shunto, which I saw you saw earlier just there. That's a fantastic photograph. I love it. So the company made rolling stock for railways all around the world. It also produced equipment for World War One and World War Two, notably munitions, vehicles, tanks, and sections for the D-Day's Mulberry Harbour, the pivoting sections it made. Um, in addition, they also made trains for the London Underground and the Toronto Subway. This is one of the, the tube trains that they made. The stock in trade, however, were these things, the private owner goods wagons, mainly to carry coal, although some actually carried other materials. Um, Private owner wagons are a really common sight. When British Railways were formed, they inherited over half a million. Um, and they belonged to sort of four main classes of owners. You had the colliery owners, the large and small manufacturers, industrial users, and small local coal merchants. And again, I suspect you remember earlier that Mr. Edgington, that coal delivery to Adelstrop, I suspect he was probably a local coal merchant. I don't know for sure. But of course, because every industrial process needed coal or coke, these wagons were the most popular ones, and uh, you know there were loads of them around. And uh, I've put one down here in the bottom right-hand corner, which is an iron wagon or stone wagon. They're a little bit lower because they didn't need the volume of stone was too heavy to make it top up higher. But we've got uh, sort of 118 albums of these made by the company, and they are fascinating reading. There's been some great books published by like Lightmore Publications. We've actually people have looked at these, taken photographs and researched the companies, and they are wonderful, wonderful reading. Just shows to go how much history there is in, in these wagons. However, the, the railway company also made uh, other like items. They have a classic sort of railway porter's carriage there, um, lots of those round, and they also made seats here. And this seat actually is an interesting one. It's the only one we think they did make. Uh, the logo in the middle there, you won't be able to read it there, but it says WAGR, um, and it, it's found out what it's for. It's the Western Australian Government Railway. And it seemed to me that the, the, only, the company only actually made this seat and about two other minor metal items for the Australian Government Railway, and they never purchased just anything else, just really, really odd. 
but they were they were not the only ragged manufacturers. There were several others in the county. The Albion Carriage and Wagon Works out by Grange Court there. The Standard Wagon Company at Gloucester. The Standard Wagon Company had a branch at Bullow Pill, which is another coal port. And you had the North Central Wagon Company in Gloucester as well. So there are lots of other railway wagon works being made. And this is just going to show how important these wagons were to be made and to be repaired and maintained. Doughty, um, you might not associate Doughty with railway stuff, more people associate with aircraft under carriages, but they made railway equipment, notably hydraulic retarders, which were used to control the speed of wagons on inclines in hunt shunting marshalling yards. These are more popular now on the continent in America than they are in this, this country. The sole one we had is now closed, sadly. Um, but to test these units, they had to build a sloping ramp test rig at the Ask Church site. And this is a couple of pictures of it. And the building behind that, you can see, is the old water, car water tower and reservoir for Ask Church Station. So again, a lovely little bit of history there. Uh, what can we say about Dr. Beechin? Well, the Beechin Axe Cuts, we've all heard of them. This is Churchdown Station in the process of demolition. It only fairly recently been opened up into a four-lane station, um, but it, it was closed down, sadly. Um, Beechin's Cuts closed about 55% of all stations, about 30% of route miles, and it cut nearly 70,000 railway jobs so it was terrible terrible time um, and again we've got lots of these X stations around the county the top one is Barber's Ridge which is now a private house you got um, then you've got Newant there at the bottom then you've got um, Trouble House Holt sorry at the bottom Newant's in the middle um, lots of them still retain bits of platforms simply because they're there and what's the point of removing them they can, can be quite useful and again we've got lots of railways around the county which are now sort of through walking routes that you can go on and, and you know they are nice to do but it probably would have been better if they'd still be railways wouldn't it and we'd get lots of cars off the road um coming towards the end of the talk they've got a couple of here this is a um a nice one we have a uh, miss margaret hewitt took a third class train back from paddington to her home at weymouth in october 1909 GWR managed to mislay her baggage, which is a large black leather trunk, after they collected it from a London address. And so they sent her a four-page letter of regret and a lost luggage form to complete. Um, she valued the items around 31, about £2,400 a day. It's a lot of stuff. Um, but we don't know whether she ever got it back or if GWR compensated her. And you probably won't be able to read this, but uh, half of this is actually a costume of some sort. So whether Miss Margaret Hewitt was a stage performer, we don't don't know but again it sort of gives you an idea of the sort of thing that was going on and again like your insurance companies today on the left hand side you've got on this you know on this column here it's how much it's worth on the right hand side how much is it worth today so she had to downgrade some of the things she, she'd ordered um, and this last one, I love this one, um, Gloucester's All Saints Church, now it's the Chinese Community Centre on Barton Street, was located right next to the Barton Street Junction by Eastgate Street. And of course, locomotives, you can see it there, locomotives often waiting a siding by the church or by the sort of on the main line, waiting for signals after they'd run around their train or they were shunting in the marshalling yard. So they would sit there just waiting for the signals to go. Um, and as, of course, as the locomotives stood idle, steam pressure would build up in their boilers and at irregular intervals this excess steam would blow off making an awful lot of noise and in 19, May 1925 this was causing severe annoyance to the church um, and this is entered in, in the church wardens the mystery minutes saying attention was drawn to the nuisance caused by locomotives blown off steam outside the church during divine service the chairman stated that he would interview with the local authorities and the need to, to, to discuss the matter Eventually, actually, in about three or four weeks, the matter went away. We don't know whether they did contact them or not, but it, it did go away. So, you know, All Saints people could seem quite happy without the railways disturbing them from that time onwards. So that brings us to the end of the talk. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, our next event at the Heritage Hub is Stay on Track, which is on Saturday, 2nd of December, 1 to 4. It's again, it's a special focus on trains, railways and stations. We've got a couple of great talks, uh, one on the construction of Honeybourne to Cheltenham Railway by Chris Webb, who's the safety advisor for the Gloucester Royal Railway Trust. We've also got a talk, Rails in the Forest by Ian Pope, who's the chair of the Dean Forest Railway Museum Trust. We've also got several train model layouts on site, including Thomas the Tankin, 
engine, which you can play with. I'm looking forward to that. Um, we've got one on Horton Road, display of treads. We've got a diorama of concrete progress, which is a type of wagons. Um, we've also got some seven mil large locomotives in the Seven and Rye Railway brought by Ian Pope. And also we've got the display of railway related archives. So some of the things you've seen today, you'll see on Saturday, that Saturday if you come. Um, and if you're interested in the Her Heritage Railways, we'll also have representatives from the Dean Forest Railway, the Gloucestershire and Warwickshire Railway, the Vale of Berkeley Railway, and also Gloucestershire Transport History, a website that looks at a lot of the history. And of course, as usual, we've got free refreshments in the afternoon and the family history of Central will be open if you want to chat about any potential drivers, guards, and signalmen in your family. We will say, you know, if you do want to come to these, if you want to come to the talks, can you please book online for that? Only because of space reasons. And finally, for me, um, our next online talk will be on Wednesday, the 24th of January. I know that's a long time away. How will you cope without me? Um, but basically, it's going to be all about sitting on the dock of the bay. It's a look at our ports and docks and the waterways of Gloucestershire. And on that note, I will hand back over to Gemma and we'll try and take any questions. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much, John. That was absolutely amazing. Um, I'm sure we're all feeling like uh, we've learned a great deal there. Um, just a few comments. Um, so Robert, first of all, said to say uh, great stuff, first of all. Um, on the subject of accidents, there was a major collision at Charfield in, he thinks, 1928. Um, and that interesting Charfield one, um, big story about it. So I put that back on that big bit. The big thing about the Charfield one, it was a really horrific accident. Um, and the, the thing was, there were two children who were never claimed amongst the bodies. Um, and I believe it was the first time they tried to use tooth identification to try and trace these children. And as far as I'm aware, they were never, ever traced. And, and I think they're buried in Charfield. So really, really horrific thing. But yeah, there've been lots of other ones. There's another major crash at Bullo Pill when a, 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 an express train ran into the back of a cattle train. There are, there are quite a few. And if you go onto the, um, there's a railways archive and they, ha they actually going through the process of um, scanning all the Board of Trade accident reports and putting them online. So if you go onto that website, um, you can actually search for your favourite railway crash, if that's the word to use. Brilliant. Thank you very much, John. Um, another comment from David. I think it was in relation to talking about the auto co coach and auto trains um, when you were talking about that side. Um, and he mentioned the fact that the fireman had to operate the brake. Um, Jane would like to say uh, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, Karen would like to ask, can you say any more about how much um, railway workers were expected to move around? Um, her grandfather, who was a signalman, moved from from uh, Wink Wincanton to Yeovil um, to Cheltenham to Birmingham New Street, um, which um, she assumes was uh, for promotions. That was the 1920s to 1950s. Okay, yeah, I, mean, I think they, they did move around, um, but I suspect, I don't know, I suspect it was a case of you know, the station master say, do you want to move or do you want to stay? I suspect there's a little bit of that going on. And um, certainly I would thought it was primarily for promotion prospects, I would think. Um, and I suppose if you're happy to remain in Porter all your life, you'd happily do that. But I think with the, certainly with the, the sort of the higher up echelons, I like the signalmen who were quite an important job, they probably moved around more. Um, there are some very good books on sort of the what I've got at home got GWR railway servants and they've got chapters on each of the main roles in the railway so I uh, I hadn't had a look for that t t time precluded that but you know have a look at books like that and some of the railway paraphernalia and you, you're bound to find sort of your answers I think um, also I guess in maybe in some of the local newspapers there might be notifications of when somebody moved to where you know new signalman arrives at so and so possibly Thanks, John. Um, Rob C um, said, excellent talk. He wants to know um, if the presentation is going to be used again. Um, if so, he wants to uh, point out a photo caption um, error. Yes, please, uh, Rob, if you could um, either send us that by email or pop it up here, um, that would be useful because we probably will use the presentation again in the future. Uh, David would like to say um, thanks for the informative talk and could you send the link to the video? I believe that gets sent um, to you all um, after the talk when it goes up, um, so it will be online as well. Um, uh, 
uh jackie harris said uh thank you very much very interesting um katie pritchard's put up a couple of um links that might be useful to you all um howard um says it has intrigued me since um around 2000 that when the old lanthony road gloucester docks crossing rails were removed there were two sets of rails one um being around uh, 300 millimetres below the top set. Is there any archive material on when this first uh, set were covered over? Thanks. I don't know if there are actually. Um, some of the rails, railways layouts fell in between ordnance survey plans. And a lot of the time, the actual, there's not much information on the council archive. Uh, uh, for example, I know looking at some, I was looking at the tramways into the Gloucester Central Station, um, the 19, 1918, and there's no information about these rails being laid at all. So I suspect there's not a huge amount of information. You might find some in the Network Rail Archive or the Swin, the Swin Steam Museum at Swindon. They've got a really good archive and they're really helpful for looking at that sort of thing. So that's a possibility. It might just be that the there might have been two sets of rails rails either they couldn't be bothered to replace the old rails and just put them on top of it i guess um or it might have been a slight deviation in the track where they decided to alter it and left the old ones there and also yeah thanks for the information on the class 40 stroke class 45 um i i was looked at that and i was going by what the caption said and I'm, i wasn't convinced on that either i'd heard it being a class 45 a classic peak but yeah so thank you i can't i can't see who put that up there but thank you very much Thank you. Um, we've got several comments just saying thank you for the talk. Thanks. Thanks for those. Really appreciate them. Uh, Tony Yates says um, a reminder about railway museums in Gloucestershire, um, uh, such as a collection held um, at the end of the narrow gauge um, uh, railway um, ex Doughty at the TWSR Toddington. Um, and um, I uh, oh, yes. Rob C's popped up um, the comment about that. Um, uh, will the talks on December the 2nd be repeated um, as unfortunately he cannot attend? Um, yeah, they probably won't be repeated. I don't think we video those, but you'd have to look out for when um, Ian Pope and when Dave actually do them elsewhere. Um, I mentioned it, another railway museum I should have mentioned is the is the GWR Museum at Colford in the Forest of Dean, and also at the Dean Forest Railway. There's a superb little museum there as well. So there are, you know, it's great. There are so many railway things around the county. You know, as you can probably tell, I quite like trains. <laughs> Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much, John. And just a couple of other comments just to say thank you very much. And I think that leads us to the end of this talk. So um, thank you to everybody um, for um, coming today. Um, I think we've all really enjoyed it. Um, obviously, if you do have any questions, do email in to us. Um, that would be great. And we look forward to seeing you in January. Have a very nice Christmas, if it's not too early to say that. Um, and we hope to see you soon. Thank you. <laughs>